Hello everyone! This is Victor from Facilita, and today I'm kicking off a new program called MBA Secrets. MBA Secrets is a series of interviews in which I talk to current and former MBA students about their experiences. Today my guest is Vlad Baskakov, my friend and former colleague from McKinsey Moscow. Currently Vlad is a first year student at Harvard Business School. Vlad graduated from high school economics in Moscow with a master's degree in e-commerce. He worked at Accenture and McKinsey. Right before joining Harvard as a student, he was head of growth at Get, one of the major competitors of Uber. Hey Vlad, thanks a lot for finding time to talk to me today. I would like to discuss with you four topics. Topic number one is why you decided to go to Harvard rather than to any other university. Topic number two is your current Harvard experience and what's most interesting and impressive about it. Topic number three is your personal finance and topic number four is your current job search. So if you don't mind, let's get started. And my first question is why you decided to go to Harvard rather than to any other MBA program? So I think there are several things. First mm -hmm. of all, it's the brand. Yep. And I think it's really the strongest brand that helps you a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and the second thing is alumni network. Yep. Uh, and I feel it especially right now in any airport, I can mm -hmm. find people wearing like, you know, HBS jackets or <laughs> just university jackets. So mm -hmm. I think it's a great tool for networking. Um, mm -hmm. And finally, campus. I've actually visited like five or six top MBAs and uh, HBS campus was my favorite. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that are the reasons. Mm -hmm. So I see brand, networking, and also campus. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, that brings us me actually to my second question about people. Uh, I I'm surprised you haven't mentioned them. So what type of people do you think would be ideal for the program? And what quantities uh, do people in your program have in common, in your opinion? Well, I, uh, yeah, I, I didn't mention them because, um, yeah, I think the the people at top MBAs are pretty much the same. They have mm -hmm. the similar backgrounds. Um, overall, I think um, people at MBA are really diverse. Uh -huh. It's really hard, hard to generalize them somehow. Um, they're pretty much the same in backgrounds. There are tons of people from consulting, from private equity, mm -hmm. from tech and FMCG. I think what is in common is that they had lots of achievements in the past. Mm -hmm. um, they have they share the same goal, uh, so they they all want to either work for a big company and mm -hmm. make it here, or like alternatively, they they want to build their own company. Mm -hmm. So they they have this pretty much like you know pretty big ambitions, um, mm -hmm. and they yeah they they are from different countries. So I think they are pretty much diverse, but what what is in common is like you know lots of achievements and like you know common goals. Mm -hmm. So I see lots of achievements and lots of ambition, I guess, as you mentioned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But do you think there is a typical profile of a Harvard student? Uh, it's, it's a hard question because here I realize that uh, people are really different. Uh, the thing I noticed is that each Harvard student, in addition to, you know, perfect job track, they all have some, um, you know, extra curricular activities and achievements. Mm -hmm. Some people can dance, some people can sing, some like are uh, fans of martial arts. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not just a hobby, they are at some professional level at, uh, at all this stuff. So I noticed mm -hmm. that like, if you are dancing, you are like a really good dancer. If uh -huh. you are like a of martial arts, you, you can do some crazy things. I realized that at some point and it, it, it was like a great discovery for me. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So you need to be great, not only at your regular job, but also at something else. And by great, I mean really professional, really amazing level. Yeah, it, it should be, I think, either amazing level or it should be uh, amazing growth uh, according to yourself. So if you compare yourself to, like, you know, your previous yourself, like mm -hmm. five years ago, you could say that it's a great growth that I made. Mm -hmm. And you can tell that, that story to admission committee. I, I think it's also great and it helps. Mm -hmm. 
So what I understand now about Harvard people is that they are ambitious, uh, have lots of achievements in the past, and they are quite diverse. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, so that actually brings me to my third question about uh, your experience at Howard. I, get, I guess you had lots of interesting experiences with people. So I'm wondering, what is your most uh, exciting, most memorable experience in uh, Howard? Or maybe most important experience, both from the curricular point of view, I mean, classes, professors, and also from the extracurricular point of view, meaning clubs, uh, people going out, traveling, you know, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So if we talk about classes, my expectations uh, were actually lower. So mm -hmm. I, I like I have a consulting background. I have a I have a technology background, yep. and I didn't expect that I will learn so much things. But you know, the first thing I realized here that the field method, like I think it's a great differentiator of HBS. It's a field method. It really works. It's it, it's not like a marketing tool that they put on HBS side. It it's really unique, and mm -hmm. I think this method is unique in uh, teaching. Um, not only hard skills, like not only providing you background in finance or accounting or mm -hmm. strategy, it's really good in um, teaching you soft skills because, like, you know, if you take leadership, for example, the best way to learn leadership is to go and lead. Yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that the second best method of teaching you leadership is presenting HBS cases. I think. Mm -hmm. That, that was a great discovery for me, and I, I found so many uh, stories that resonated with my previous experience in HBS cases. Uh, I think the program was really good, and I was really excited about my professor at HBS Lead, who was one of the most, most well-known CEOs uh, in the United States in the previous years. So that was like definitely my, my great experience at HBS. Mm -hmm. uh, that's about curricula. Um, so as for... Yeah, one more thing about classes. I think classes also have a great element of fun. Mm -hmm. uh, all the professors, they they are not just, you know, concentrated on, uh, uh, like, teaching you, but they also try to bring the positive atmosphere. Um, mm -hmm. So, for example, we had one professor who was constantly coming to class and telling us stories about his kids. <laughs> and uh, he was telling us stories of how he was preparing for championship in weightlifting, uh, mm -hmm. how he was trying to lose the weight. And, like, guess what? By, by the end of the semester, he really became the world champion in weightlifting. Wow, that's so, amazing. Really? Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, and, uh, you know, at the end of every semester, we have classes like you know the last class of every sem semester is uh, the class when we roast the professor so we are thinking of some fun activities uh, for the class and it provides just some so, so many positive emotions um, I mean you're definitely not only learning in the class but you're having lots of fun in class and uh, yeah I think that, 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 that that's a great um, that's a great thing to have. So it's not just class, it's educational experience. Lots of stuff put together. I, I would say that it's completely different educational experience like compared to what you have in college. It's different because the professor, like, you know, you are learning not from the professor, but you are learning from your classmates that all provide very different points of view. Um, uh, so the p professor is like the captain of the team. He he, uh, like you know, points out who should speak. He structures the discussion. But the main people from like f from whom you learn are your classmates. Um, and yeah, like the great part of, of the class is the atmosphere, like internal jokes. You 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 get to know people better. Uh, you you learn different you know examples from other countries, so I think it's a really really great experience. Well, th that's interesting. You mentioned that you learn a lot from your classmates, but I think that also suggests that you need to understand your classmates very well, and you be you need to be on the same page with them. 
I was wondering if it was easy for you to be on the same page with native English speakers, with Americans, because I think it's not just a matter of language, but also the matter of culture, how you perceive things, how you understand things differently. How did you mm -hmm. manage to uh, get along with them? Actually, not necessarily. We may not be on the same page. And actually, professors appreciate the discussion. So the ideal class at HBS is the class where you have this discussion with different points of views, when other people can disagree with you, provide their own point, like, you know, provide some evidence for that point. So that what actually makes this method work. Uh, and that's, that, that's what I love about it. Ah, so you don't need to necessarily agree with the class on some issue, even though the majority of the class, for example, are Americans and they think one direction and you you are a foreigner, you, you think in a different direction. And that's fine. They don't make you agree, right? Absolutely fine. That's absolutely fine. They don't make you agree. The professors don't provide their own point of view. Their main objective is to structure the discussion. That, that's like, you know, the main point of case method. Mm -hmm. So they're more like uh, members of the team rather than authority from college. Yeah, they, they, they are, I would say they are the leaders of the team who, um, like, you know, who define the key points, who put like the key points on the board. Uh, they collect different opinions. They, yeah, they, they you know, put the some like chaos into the system and make, make all this work. And yeah, the like you know the best professors they are really good at uh, at, at making this discussion. Mm -hmm. I see. So this is what concerns uh, curricular activities so far. And I understand that you you came to appreciate. Uh, educational method at Harvard more than you used to when you just applied. So this Absolutely. is uh, a change in your expectations. Uh, mm -hmm. What about extracurricular activities? Um, we're having lots of fun. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes some time to, to, to know everyone because it's quite hard. You have 90 people in, uh, in your section and you have 900 people in your class. So it, it takes a while to, to, to get to know each other. But I think, I think it takes like two or three months to, to, to get really connected. I personally felt it after the, um, I don't know, it, it, was, it, it took me probably like two or three months to, 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 to get connected. But right now I very much feel that, that we are like, you know, a, a family, at least with 90 people in from my section. Now my objective is to get connected with more people from other sections and to, 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 to know them better. Mm -hmm. When you go out, what do you usually do? Uh, I think it's, there are like three types of activities. Uh, the first type is different events organized by HBS. It, it's not the HBS, it's actually uh, HBS student groups like student association or European club that organize large parties, go into the clubs. Um, yeah, I, I think that it's like European club that organizes the best parties. It's some advertising. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah. So you're, uh, that, you're part of the European club, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the second type of activity is going to some local bar or restaurant with 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 your um, section mates and uh, you know the third type of activity like very often we we, we go just to to the place of uh, some person we with, with our section and we we have some like you know house party there so it's yeah it, it's uh, you know like some parties um, some some common activities like trips also we have lots of trips uh if you think about it hbs like i think every two or three weeks there is a group of students traveling somewhere in us or maybe not us people are traveling to iceland to europe um like different locations so if you want to travel you can join easily and in group and make great great connections yeah that, that's what i wanted to say i think uh, that Trips are a great way to, to meet people and to get to know people better. 
Yeah, it's uh, it's. Uh, I mean, trips are mainly uh, you know be- among the sections. So you, you have your small section of ninety people, and you have like you know the parties where you you get close to each other, and then you have trips where you can connect with with people from other other sections. Mm-hmm. I see. That's interesting. But then you you get to travel quite a lot. Just probably the the way you 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 did when you were in consulting. Uh, yeah, I tried not to travel when I was in consulting, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now you have to. I see. Yeah. Vlad, what do you think uh, is your biggest learning from the Howard MBA so far? Um, yeah, I think the the biggest learning, as I've said, was um, I had probably like three three learnings. Two of them are you know corrected with curricula. I. I um, I think I lacked some financial education and background, so I learned a lot about finance. My second learning was about leadership. I was always, you know, trying to find the time to read some books on the topic and to structure my thoughts. HBS helped me a lot, providing with, like, you know, tons of cases from various industries, like, of how people lead the companies. And like the greatest learning there is how people are ready to take risks. So like, you know, when you come to, uh, when you come to a company, uh, like as a leader, it's really difficult for you to, to take a risk. All the extraordinary cases about the extraordinary people we, we learn at HBS, it's about the, the leaders who, who took, took the risk and who, who made a change in the company. So, I think you know taking the leadership to to make a change is probably my my greatest learning of all that cases. And uh, finally, I think great experience was networking. Um, I think it depends on uh, on your like you know personal type. If you're like an extrovert or introvert, it depends on your background. But some people are really good at networking. Some people are bad at networking. I think like job search at HBS. And like different networking events, they really teach you how to organize that stuff, how to, you know, write uh, thank you emails, how to get connected with alumni, how to chit chat on networking events. That, 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 that's a great skill that, that develops here. And I think it will greatly help me in the future while making connections. I think you also mentioned some time back in our conversations that Uh, Harvard changed your attitude to networking that before Harvard you thought that networking is kind of not not really a waste of time but not the necessary thing and now you came to feel that it's it makes your life more pleasant more interesting yeah yeah I mean uh, you're you know net, everything that you say should should come like you know right from inside from you You should be super natural and you should be naturally interested in other people. And that that what helps you develop your your connection. And that was, you know, a great a great change of my mentality. I became much more interested in other people, in uh, different experiences and in various backgrounds, mainly because here I realized how diverse people are. Uh, I, I learned that there are like lots of different viewpoints they they can all live together and now i'm you know genuinely much more interested in other people and much more interested in like you know making connections and asking um asking deeper questions and making this you know um deeper connections um, and it's interesting because you think of networking as something that that is not That is not about deep connections, but you know the really great networking is when you get connected with some person and you try to manage this network for you know for for some period of time. You get to know each other better, and then you you really benefit out of that, or probably the other benef- person benefits out of that. So it's like you know a mutual process. And I guess the benefit is not necessarily monetary. It's also emotional, right? So you just Absolutely. get connected. Yep. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's not monetary. It, it may be an advice. It, it may be some guidance or coaching. 
um, you know, especially when you when you get connected with some HBS alumnus, um, they they are all ready to help. Uh, the response rate is really high. Uh, I mean, especially compared to like you know some alumni networks of uh, you know big 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 corporations or even like you know consulting network. The response rate from alumni network is really high. Like I would say that fifty percent of people would answer your email um, first email. If you like you know if you continue, you, you will have even a better response rate. Uh, they, they all agree to, to, like, you know, to have a quick call with you to, to help you with an advice. So people are pretty much open because they remember um, themselves when they were HBS students. So they, they, they are ready to, you know, to, 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 to share their experiences. That's, that, that's really valuable. Hmm, that's interesting because what I heard previously about Howard is that people tend not to respond quite often. But interesting to hear the the opposite story firsthand. Yeah, we are, we are right now doing a job search, and uh, we can compare the response rate from you know consulting alumni networks and uh, um, MBA alumni networks. I would say that MBA networks are much better. Um, yeah, and they work. And everything else depends on you. I mean, it may it may be just one phone conversation, and the person could just share with you his previous experience. But I mean, if you are trying to make this connection, you you can make it work. You can you can make this connection long standing. It, it only depends on you. And and this is a skill that you have to learn here, and it it, it requires time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it definitely does. I think. Vlad, so what you're telling about Harvard is amazing, but I was wondering if there's anything you would like to change about Harvard, or is it just all 100% amazing and 100% what you expected and above? Yeah, I think the first months at Harvard are pretty tough um, because they try to front load, um, I think, most of the, um, you know, uh, the, most of the knowledge and most of the classes. So you have a tough schedule uh, of classes in the beginning. You have lots of different uh, activities. Um, you have parties. You have lots of networking. And it's really hard to prioritize because you don't know. Uh, like everything is so interesting. And you don't know what, what, what to select. There are like, you know, company conversations. Uh, like different career coaching, like, and everything is, like, you know, is taking place at the same time. Uh, there are, like, tons of events that are conflicting with each other in your schedule. Uh, and you have, like, lots of preparation for classes because HBS is not, it's not a vacation. It's it's a hard work. So for the first two, two or three months, it's really difficult to combine all that stuff. So probably I would like to have it more smooth. Um, but definitely it, it becomes bait better later. So the work-life balance become, becomes better, like closer to New Year, I think. Mm -hmm. I see. So the key thing you would like to change, make it a slightly better, is to smooth your curriculum so that the first couple of months are not that hard as they are right now. It's so not only curriculum, but it's different events. Probably, probably it's just like logistically uh, they, they can do it because like, you know, they have these events because people have to like, you know, get to know each other. Uh, then we have uh, career sessions because we have to prepare for the job search. And then we have to front load most like, you know, the hardest cases and so on because uh, like later we have less time because we will be applying for jobs. So maybe, maybe it should be like that. Uh, I have no answer, but, uh, MBA, it's, it's not about having a vacation. It's, it's about having a hard job. Mm -hmm. It's, I think it's about, uh, learning new stuff and probably becoming a new person. Definitely. But becoming a new person, um, uh, out of your comfort zone, I would say. Mm -hmm. I see. Well, I think now I understand uh, something about your Howard experience. 
But let's switch gears a bit now and talk for a while about your personal finance uh, to the point you are comfortable, of course. And mm -hmm. here, my key question is uh, whether you had to borrow a student loan and if so, how are you going to repay it? Because I remember from my personal experience when I was going to Stanford, it was very difficult for me to find a suitable loan. And I basically had to borrow lots of money and eventually I decided I, I wouldn't go. So I was wondering, what's the situation with you and how are you looking at it? Yeah, there are several things. First of all, your you have a student budget. That's the amount estimated by HBS what you need to, what you need to study here then uh, they split this amount into financial aid and a student loan uh, or like your personal finance if you, if you have them so um, it's quite easy to get the financial aid um, if you are coming from you know a developing country where you have uh, lower currency rates um and probably not the biggest salaries i don't know I, I i can't say about the situation here in us i don't know uh yeah but as far as i know most of the people coming from developing countries they have it the financial aid covers uh, a great portion of uh, what you need to to pay for your education so it can be i think out of uh, up to 70 percent of the payment for education so for education, yeah, then you have like personal expenses, but like, you know, like the rest, the rest of your education and your personal expenses is covered by, by the loan. So, I mean, you, you can go with zero money and you, I mean, you can be sure that it will be all covered by, um, by other source. So that's the first point. By the way, it, it's interesting that financial aid is actually a fellowship that is provided by different funds. For me personally, it was an entrepreneurship fund that was created by HBS alumni. It was alumni of probably 1970 or something like this. So wow. long time yeah, ago. Uh, yeah, a long time ago. And um, at, at some point when they had like, you know, like every five years they have they have a meeting here at HBS. So at some point they, they've created created this fund uh, on one of these meetings here at HBS and uh, now they have students. So uh, I, I think it's really interesting and I will probably have a, have a dinner with some of them um, later in the semester. So uh, yeah, I think it's an interesting fact. So um, yeah, th th that's a, like the loan and financial aid is the first point. The second point is I think I'm lucky enough to live in Boston and on campus. HBS because um, like living on campus is really cheap uh, you don't need to spend lots of money uh, food costs are really low because you, you can eat on campus uh, transportation costs are low because uh, you have uber pool in Boston it, it takes like three to five bucks to, to travel to, to any part of Boston so it, it's really cheap so like the living expenses are not are not that huge. It's it's actually lower than than I expected. And so uh, I would say that you need the thing you need money for is your traveling. So if you would like to travel and to make these connections, you 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 really need lots of money. And the more you invest in that, the more connections you will have. So yeah i would i would think of it more like you know investments in 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 your relationships with people than uh like necessary investments for living if you if you come here with with your family and if you don't have time for um for networking then like your cost will be mainly like the cost for your living that mm -hmm. may be much more if you have a family but that's that's another story Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. So interesting. That means that uh, you basically invest not in your education because you, you, you get a scholarship, which is quite large, a fellowship, sorry. Yeah. But you invest in networking. So the, the amounts available to you, your budget is proportional to the number of network, uh, the size of your network that you can build throughout the course of your studies. I would say yes, because it should like the cost of living is pretty cheap and it may be different for other MBA programs. For example, if you live in New York, I assume that it 
it will be much higher. Um, probably, probably somewhere in San Francisco, like the cost of living. If you if you take into account the housing, it may be also high. Um, I would say that living on campus, uh, eating on campus, having Boston that is like super close to campus, it really helps you to 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 have these cost savings. So I would say that yeah, the main cost will be uh, your traveling. Mm -hmm. By the way, do you personally feel financial constraints in your student life? For example. Do you have enough money to travel uh, as much as you would like to? Uh, no, because I think the sky is the limit. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> I'd, love to, I'd love to travel uh, every every weekend. I, I don't have this opportunity. Okay. Uh, also, like I have some like you know personal travel back back to my home country due to personal reasons. So I yeah. Um, I have all that constraints. I would definitely love to to have more of that. Um, we'll see. I mean, um, um, it really depends. Probably you can make. I, I heard like various alternatives. So you can make your own club, and you can invite the people to that club, and uh, you will have brilliant connections. I heard about the story of the woman that made uh, like you know fancy dinner club or something and she she was having new people every week in that club and later it became something like you know an official club at hbs or something so you you, you can organize different events yourself and you can make all this network so it just depends on you uh, yeah i would say that my my conclusion is that mm, financial burden is not that hard if you have financial aid um if you have a loan and like if you if you live on campus i mean it's 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 not as hard as i expected moreover if you if you want to do a job search on the west coast for example here at hbs they provide you some extra money so you, you can apply for that um so they actually can compensate a lot of your travel if you're doing job search so uh this also helps. Plus, we have some uh, tracks. It's like you know a combination of um, um, you know job search track, and uh, it's also a great network. And for example, I did a West track right before New Year. We spent uh, four days in the Bay Area visiting different companies, um, networking with alumni. Uh, it was also great. I mean, it it was. Probably not not lying on the beach, but it was it was great because I could uh, you know connect with more people from other sections, and at the same time um, I could do a job search. Mm -hmm. I see, Vlad. You also Vlad. mentioned that you were lucky to get a spot on campus, right? Mm -hmm. I was wondering if it is difficult to get a spot on campus, and what do you need to do in order to get one? Well, it's a lottery. So there are like different types of housing at HBS. You participate in the lottery for them. There are like two types of housing. One is called dorms. Like the main difference is that it like does not have chicken, but uh, kitchen, but you have your personal room um, and bathroom, of course. Uh, like the second type of housing is like you know a separate flat like separate apartment it's a bit more expensive uh it's a lottery for both but i would say that uh like 90 percent of people live either on campus or really close to campus alternatively you can live in cambridge and uh, rent an apartment in cambridge and it's it's also close to campus so i would say that you know the main advantage of living in the dorms is that you have tunnels that you can use in winter to, 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 to get anywhere on campus. So you actually don't need to have a code. I, I really have a friend who, who, who does not have a, a winter code yet. <laughs> that sounds like a dream for someone in Moscow. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so I think I understand now your situation with personal finance and my key takeaway is that finance is not really a huge burden for an MBA student, especially at Harvard. And there are 
options how you can deal with it and you don't necessarily need to grab lots of loans you can do with scholarships and you can also try to reduce your expenses but if you want to have uh, more a larger network if you want to go to more trips you need to spend more money however there are also opportunities to do to build your network in different ways in other ways that are not that uh, expensive so to speak yes yes mm -hmm. i see now finally let's talk about job search i guess mm -hmm. the most interesting and the hottest topic right now to, to, mm -hmm. to lots of uh, mba students so my first question is uh, what do grads of harvard usually do as internships in summer and what do they do after graduation so like you know the main objective of any I think most of MBA applicants is switching the career path. So, like, what I see typically is that I have, we have here people from PE funds who, who want to switch to hedge funds. We have people from consulting who, who want to do private equity. We have entrepreneurs who want to do consumer goods or, like, you know, guys from consumer goods who want to go to consulting and so on. So... People are trying to make a career switch. Uh, so you have a dedicated period at HBS. Um, so everything starts like, you know, in the fall when you start to do networking, trying to connect with different companies and uh, like, you know, make some connections. They really help because if somebody could make your reference in the company, it, it could definitely increase the chances that your resume will be uh, like selected. So uh, you do networking till probably uh, New Year. After New Year, we have a dedicated interview period when we, uh, um, it's actually the first wave of interviews. It's mainly the companies who partner with HBS to, uh, to hire graduates. Um, they, uh, they all come to like the hotel close here to HBS and they, 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 uh, make, uh, the interviews with, uh, HBS guys. So, uh, yeah, that's the first wave after it, um, uh, I don't know, probably 15% of, uh, HBS folks get their job offers. Mainly it's, uh, I would say consulting, uh, probably some consumer goods and a bit of tech then a bit later we have a second wave of interviews um probably a bit more tech and consumer goods um and some pe funds um yeah and of course investment banking so i think by that time like nearly 30 percent of people will have their job offers and then we have March, April, and May, when mainly technology companies are hiring and private equity. So people are having lots of interviews at that time. This is not coordinated by HBS. It's mainly by your networking. Um, so yeah, you, you connect with alumni, asking them uh, for like, you know, uh, job advice, uh, looking what opportunities do they have in their companies, trying, like, you know, leveraging your friends' network, networks of your um, uh, HBS folks, and trying to find, uh, like, you know, a, a job place. So, yeah, I would say that by, by May, hopefully everyone has uh, job offers. Mm -hmm. But... Uh... If, if I got it right, you said that by March, about 30% of people got job over, offers. And those job offers are from uh, consumer goods, from consulting, some from PE funds and some from investment banking. Yeah. 30%. Yeah. And then March, April and May, uh, the remaining 70% get job offers, right? Yeah, yeah, pro pro probably so. The problem is that for, for many companies, it's really hard to start the application process in, uh, uh, in winter. So especially the fast-growing companies like technology companies, they, they all uh, start their process in, uh, in spring. So yeah, you, you have um, all this long and tough process of looking for a job. Mm -hmm. 
So it seems like 70% of all students want to do uh, some tech as their internship. Is that right? Not, no, not necessarily because it's, um, it's also smaller consulting companies. It's also private equity funds. Uh, it's also other consumer good companies. So like, you know, um, in January and February, I think you have the companies that are highly organized uh, in their recruitment process. Mm -hmm. Vlad, do you have any idea what you would like to do uh, as your internship? Yeah, I would like to continue my internship in technology. So my uh, interview process is um, has already started, but I guess it will continue for, for quite a long. Uh, so having interviews with the companies right now. Is it difficult to get a job uh, at a tech company for an MBA student without a specific background in technology? Uh, I would say that it depends on, um, on the company. For a big technology company, it's, I think uh, the main difficulty is not the lack of technical background. The main difficulty is the huge competition. Because, I mean, you have like 900 people from HBS, probably uh, not all of them apply to technology companies, but if, if at least 400 people apply, then you have a huge, huge, huge competition. Um, the, the competition, I think, is even higher at private equity where you have... Uh, like the company, like because you know, technology companies are hiring like 10, 20 people. Uh, private equity are hiring like two, three people. So they are probably the competition is even higher. So um, yeah, uh, the, the the main difficulty I think is is the competition. And if you have the necessary background, it will definitely help you at least to to, to get to the interview. But but then on the interview. Uh, you, you have like you know it, it's not about your your background the interview is more about how you can present your story and how you can i, I don't know do cases or I, I don't know brain teasers or whatever vlad is there any discrimination against foreign students in the us uh, i mean the visa process i guess is quite long and difficult especially for a work visa does it somehow affect your prospects of getting a job uh, at a company in the US? I would say it's not about discrimination. The, the, the companies are pretty much transparent. Uh, they, um, they, I mean, some of them just say that we don't hire internationals. Some of them hire internationals for one particular position and will not hire internationals for the other particular position. Probably it is related to the budget of a particular department or something like this. So you can know this. I mean, in most of the cases, you know it from job description. So yes, actually, it limits your your opportunities. That's the first point. The second point is um, like you know the natural problem. It's it's language because you have to be persuasive in a foreign language. You have to tell your story in a foreign language. And it's completely different from speaking English in your home country with, with, I don't know, it's completely different like when telling your story in English to a Russian guy in Russia uh, and compared to telling your story here to, 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 you, to a US citizen. So people here, what I've noticed in the interview, people really dig, dig deep into details they make these deep dives into a story, and you have to be prepared for this. And very often, you you need like you know a huge vocabulary to um, I don't know to provide the context to explain the specific from your country uh, to provide all your experience. So yes, I mean you are not in the same position as you know locals. It's definitely so. The great advantage is that what I see seen here is that internationals have very often a much broader background than the locals um, and I think it's connected with the average uh, age I think that the average age of internationals is 
higher than uh, like the average age at MBA of US citizens. Mm -hmm. So what I can conclude is that uh, there are difficulties for foreigners, but those difficulties are not necessarily connected to the visa issues. They are also connected to the skills, especially communication skills in a foreign language that a, in English that a foreigner needs to possess in order to get a spot. Yes, yes, because it's it's not about it's it's not only about no know, knowing the language, it's uh, about about you know the ability to sell your, to sell yourself in a foreign language, and if you are like you know. You, you can be a good actor in your like local language. You can be a good salesperson in your local language. But if you have your like a foreign language and you have to like you know to translate everything in your mind and you have to think about it, it I mean it's naturally much harder to like you know to be persuasive. I think that's that's the main point. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can understand that. But Vlad, do you have any ideas what, what you would like to do after you graduate? Yeah, um, I mean, uh, I have to be pragmatic here. So I would say that I would pick a place where I would be able to sell me uh, at my best. So um, I'm not necessarily stick to United States. So... I'm pretty much open to to global opportunities. Most definitely, I will I will stay in technology. Uh, I'm not sure in which country yet. For example, like recently, I've got an offer from uh, Italian company for internship. So maybe maybe I, I try something in Europe. Um, maybe here in US. I, I don't know. We'll see. But I think that I would try to be pragmatic about that and thinking about visa issues, uh, global economy, global political situation, and so on. I will try to take into account all the factors. And as we know, in the last days, they, they are like, you know, they're changing so fast. So I made a decision not, not, not to think about it right now, but to be really pragmatic uh, closer to, to, to the end of my um, HBS. Study. Yeah, that's right. You need to tackle problems once they once you encounter them and not long before. <laughs> yes, that's right. Just maybe one last question I wanted to ask you. Uh, can you share a piece of advice to prospective candidates, uh, prospective applicants at Howard? Something uh, that you wish you would have known back when you applied or when you thought about application? Yes, uh, I would say that, um, well, it's, it's not about the application pro process because I finally got here. So I, uh, um, I would say that to get here, you really have to dedicate uh, lots of time. It's, it, it's really, I mean, it's really about how much time you spend with your application, how much time you spend in your GMAT, and how persistent you are in in your efforts. Um, yeah, the second advice is probably try to try to save money for MBA. It will help you a lot. Yes, uh, and think think about it ahead. And um, the third advice is try to get to to the top MBA school because my my personal thinking about that is that the brand helps a lot. The great the great uh, job search process, established job search process helps a lot. And I, like my feeling is that the better the school is, the better the job search process you will have. Um, so try to aim at the best school or probably the school that fits best your objectives. Um, yeah, and once you're here, try to do more networking, try to manage your energy, and try to ask more advice on, um, you know, what's beneficial for you, what's not beneficial for you. So, you know, being more selective in in, in activities. So I would say, like, try try to do less with uh, bigger impact. Mm -hmm. Kind of eighty twenty approach from consulting. Yes, yes, yes. And to do that, you should ask 
like lots of advice from like you know the second year students from the professors and so on so try to do lots of research to understand what what really works here and what really deserves your time because the main enemy at mba is your time you you, you don't have time for everything here you have to prioritize and very very often it's really hard to prioritize so yeah you you, you need to become good at this mm -hmm. i see well i guess uh, our listeners would definitely take your advice and very soon you'll get lots of questions about prioritizing <laughs> and about lots of stuff at harvard Thank you very much, Vlad. Good luck in your job search. Thank you very much, Ken. Good luck with, with your project. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Thanks a lot for listening. Please like this video, subscribe to Flexibilitas page, and stay tuned to upcoming episodes of MBA Secrets. A presto. Ciao.